Man, remember the days of horror movies? Remember when the likes of Sam Raimi or George Romero or Terrence Fisher or hell, even William Friedkin, who isn't even defined as a horror director, came along and crafted something that we truly hadn't seen before? When the story had surprises? When the movies didn't sell themselves on jump scares or gimmicky ways of using the camera? When the filmmaking craft was perhaps the highlight rather than throwing all the tropes in a blender and presenting the shake in a pedestrian way? Remember when this genre could actually create Create tension? Well, so did Zack Kreger. Barbarian. It's not only the best horror film of 2022, it's one of the most impressive horror films I've seen in years. It has everything I think a horror film should have. This really fascinating combination of the buildup and exploration of its main characters that you can find in, say, I don't know, The Exorcist, but also this modern adaptation of filmmaking technology to make the film as visually interesting as possible without sacrificing the story, which is as much an interrogation of the patriarchy as it is a gripping horror tale. There's even a jump scare or two that feel organic and are not placed in the exact positions you would expect them to be in any other horror film made today. Yes, I know, there's some exceptions, right? We've got the elevated horror genre. We have stuff like The Lighthouse, The Witch, Midsommar, but I'm talking about those mainstream studio horror movies. The stuff that has really kind of divulged into conjuring knockoff territory and it's rare when you find a studio-backed horror movie that actually delivers on the unexpected, on genre thrills. That's an exercise in creativity and letting a filmmaker go absolutely buck wild with this insane, unpredictable vision that they have. And while I don't necessarily think that 20th Century Studios under Disney would have greenlit Barbarian as we view it today, I am glad that 20th Century Fox, while it was its own studio, greenlit this film and put it into production before, you know, the mouse continued its monopoly. But anyways, here's the biggest selling point for Barbarian. I have genuinely never seen a film like this before. I mean, sure, Kreger's influences are there in the text and on the screen, but he's not just wearing them on his sleeve and relying entirely on them. He ventured out to craft a story of his own, and on that level, Barbarian is a resounding success with the added benefit of his clear talent as a filmmaker in the way he directs his performers. Seriously, I, I can't get over the fact that the guy from The Whitest Kids You Know made this this movie and is an expert craftsperson. I just, what? Where has this guy been? Can we get more films from him? I don't even care if they're horror films. Let's give this guy whatever he wants next. So come on in from the rain and learn why Barbarian is a definitive piece of horror cinema. Oh, and close the door behind you because we've got noisy neighbors. They're even spying on our browsing history. Luckily, NordVPN is here to stop them and they're bringing in more protection than just a lock on the door. It's more as if they'd move the entire house away so it can't even be spied on. NordVPN is the fastest VPN out there and can be used on up to six devices. Connect with one click or enable auto connect to gain access to over 5,500 servers in 59 countries. And if the VPN connection accidentally drops, NordVPN blocks the device from accessing the web for your safety. You can even route the traffic through two VPN servers, doubling the encryption and doubling your protection. NordVPN has become more than just a VPN. It's now a powerful cybersecurity tool. And even when traveling abroad, you can access NordVPN anywhere and stay at home virtually. Has one of the streaming platforms got content in one region that isn't available in your country? Simply change your virtual location and boom, there you go. A game isn't available in your country? No problem! Just change your virtual location and buy it. Don't let your location limit where you can play. If that freedom and protection appeals to you, then click the link in the description below or visit nordvpn.com slash filmspeakvpn to get a two-year plan plus four additional months with a huge discount. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash filmspeakvpn to get two years plus four months at a huge Huge discount. Click the link in the description below. And I just want to thank Nord so much for sponsoring this video. I think the first order of business with Barbarian is to praise Zach Kreger and his DP, Zach Cooperstein. What they did with a $10 million budget should prove that you don't need, ironically, Disney level money to craft a magnificently cinematic experience. Yes, this film was greenlit by 20th Century Fox before Disney got hold of them, so they didn't have that Disney money. Don't worry. In Barbarian, it starts with the small things. The way the shots are framed, the way the house is always looming over Georgina Campbell's Tess, beyond just the fact that a house is, you know, physically larger than a human. 
They're able to make Tess seem smaller relative to herself, and it's an effect that amplifies every time she steps outside. The absolute menace that comes off the screen every time they dolly the camera away from her. The restraint in not going for the now cliche dolly zoom, but instead, once again, shrinking Tess within the frame. The impeccable rack focuses when light bulbs turn on, the claustrophobic framing that never lets up whether Tess is in a narrow dark hallway or outside in the middle of the city at noon. And it's not just the claustrophobic shots that work, the filmmakers also know how to use wides to the benefits of the film. They frame shots in a way that allows your mind to wander, that allows your eyes to drift to be looking around the typical places where you might expect a jump scare or movement or something to happen. Even if if it doesn't happen, it nevertheless puts you on the edge of your seat. And that's effective horror filmmaking if I've ever seen it. The way that the shots play into the uneasiness, creating this sense of tension and paranoia, it's some of the best that I've seen God in, in a very long time. Most films, and modern horror is very guilty of this, are shot dryly, pedestrian even, and there's nothing remarkable about the visual storytelling as a result, especially in the age of CGI fest superhero blockbusters. Other filmmakers have no restraint, and so you get 90 minute visual extravaganzas that lose control of the storytelling entirely. Barbarian never goes in either of those wrong-headed directions. It's instead a confident approach with a deeply artistic undercurrent that results in some of the most fascinating shots and edits in recent horror cinema. There's an important dynamic being utilized here as well with light versus darkness. It's not as simple as light equals good, darkness equals bad either. True, most of the film's most upbeat moments occur during the day, and most of its most abhorrent, dour plot points occur either at night or in near total darkness of some other kind, but the reverse is also true in both cases. For example, Tess almost gets abducted, although in retrospect we know that he was actually trying to save her from the horrors that live within the house in the middle of the day, and she comes out of the film a victor in the dead of night. I'm more fascinated by how Kreger tells his story using different different levels of light. On the one hand, light is used to draw Tess into the temptation of a more positive outcome, the light turning on to show that someone is inside the house to let her out of the rain at the start, the warmth of Bill Skarsgård's Keith trying to invite Tess to join him for a drink and allow herself to open up to him, but it's also frequently what points Tess not only deeper into uncovering the plot, but lays a sort of trap for her as well. She uses a light bulb and a mirror to illuminate the beginning of the dark hallway, where her doom is nearly spelled out. It's the light from a television that lures her and later on Justin Long's AJ into a trap. Even her saving grace, the final note of the film, is the muzzle flash from a revolver that earlier on almost killed her. The movie simultaneously drags us, by way of all the camera dollying, deeper into the dark with Tess and the other characters in the film, and subsequently deeper into the tension. The addition and removal of light, the way that it ebbs and flows throughout the runtime, is directly influenced by the story. This ties into how Barbarian is, at least in part, a commentary on things not necessarily being as they seem. A masterclass in subversive filmmaking. Light and darkness, respectively, are not necessarily what you might think they are at any given moment. Tess is, similarly, a character you would think would try and stray away from the darkness of the house, yet she is willing to envelop herself within it if it means learning more about what's going on or if it means being able to save someone, even if it's someone like AJ who definitely doesn't deserve it. Her empathy and compassion, even in the direst of situations, alluded to in the beginning by her inability to leave a toxic relationship out of love are what get her into some of the film's more horrific situations, but it's also what saves her life in the end. Tess knows nothing about AJ and how awful of a person he is. She never finds out about his history either, though she definitely learns how cowardly and awful he is in a more general sense when he hurls her off the water tower later on, or how after she miraculously survives, he immediately tries to gaslight her. But we know how shitty AJ is. It's practically the first thing we learn about him, and so as an audience, the film has an effect on us of basically shouting, DON'T GO IN THERE at the screen. Not because of the threat present with the monster assailing AJ, but because AJ is a really awful person who doesn't deserve Tess risking her life to save him, but she's completely unaware of this. And I know horror gets frequently ragged on as a genre that is a vacuum for acting ability, 
but sometimes you do get The Exorcist, or Get Out, or The Lighthouse, or Midsommar, where the actors are not only talented, but they're being directed to their fullest potential. Campbell is firing on all cylinders as Tess, from her initial annoyances at the beginning when she has to share an accommodation with Keith, to the undercurrent of both dread and desperation she is experiencing because of what is implied by the recent toxic breakup, to when she is forced to fend for her life later on. Her independence manifest. Tess is a character with a million reasons to be terrified, and yet she's one of the more intelligent horror protagonists I've seen in recent memory, mainly because Zack Kreger understands the tropes of the genre and he's familiar with them as an audience member. He loves the genre, but he's also aware of how filmmakers can fall back on the crutches of the genre. And so because of this, because he knows you're screaming, don't go in there or don't do that or what are you doing? You're stupid. What the hell? Come on, no one would ever do this in a real life. And so because of that, he constructs Tess as this character who's asking the very same questions that we are, who's reacting in similar ways to how we are as an audience, and whenever she may do something that you think would be questionable for dramatic effect, it's perfectly in line with her character because we know the kind of person she is and the kind of obstacles she needs to overcome, such as reclaiming her independence, finding her own agency, and freeing herself from the advances and wrongdoings of men. It's this sort of liberating awakening for the character, and Campbell sells every last one of them. But even AJ himself is a subversion of expectations. We all know Justin Long as being this upbeat, kind person, the guy from the PC Mac commercials, the lovable idiot from Dodgeball, yeah he was in Jeepers Creepers, yeah he was in Drag Me to Hell as a douchebag, but there's this somewhat goofy but overall charming personality we associate with someone who's seemingly as harmless as Justin Long, and when we first see him on screen, that tracks with his character. Until his phone rings and you learn what AJ did to an actress he was working with on a pilot. It's the polar opposite of what we know Justin Long to be. And quickly, right after we've just watched everything go to hell for two people who we really like, you kind of find yourself thinking, Okay, I don't know how this AJ stuff connects just yet, but is this someone who I actually want the horror creature to take out? Craigar asks us to examine our own judgment, to examine our own preconceived notions of people and the kind of emotions and morals that we associate with them before even really knowing them. But most of all, let's not forget Pennywise himself, Bill Skarsgård, turning in some incredible work. I really admire the commitment to making Keith an actual good guy. It would have been the easy and cheesy move to have him be the outward nice guy with a trademark attached in the first act, only to reveal him as the villain in the climax. And obviously Skarsgård has proven that he can be as absolutely sinister and terrifying as sinister and terrifying can get. That would have been fine, predictable, you know, to be expected. It would have completely changed the story, of course, but otherwise it would have just been expected. This feels much more rewarding, both as an audience member, you get attached to Keith and your expectations are subverted when he turns out to be a really good person who is as they seem, and for Skarsgård, who should be allowed to spread his wings like this. He plays Keith's goofy, nervous demeanor incredibly well, and as he becomes more comfortable around Tess, she becomes comfortable with him, and you realize what a great chemistry they have together. Yet, there is still this little voice in the back of your head that's like, is he? Is he not? I want to like him. He seems genuine, but maybe he's feeding us information that feels a little too good to be true. Uh, it's part of what creates this overall uneasiness from frame one. From the second that interaction acts, even down to when Keith meets his demise, you're still wondering is this guy up to something? There's, there's gotta be something more that's going on. Bill Skarsgård does not play good, normal people, and yet, that's exactly what he does in the film. And so, as a result, Kreger looks at us and he's like, yeah, you thought you knew what you were in for. <laughs> oh boy. No, no, no. You were wrong from the second this film started. You never stood a chance. You, you silly little audience member. I just think any prospective horror filmmakers who watch this should take notes. Just because an actor is most famous for playing a horror villain, or really just a villain in general, does not mean they need to be cast only as that forever. Flip the script, play into audience expectations to surprise them. Your horror performances can be different. Your horror movies 
can be different. And they can say more too, as we've seen with the recent trend of socially conscious horror movies and thrillers. With everything else that's happening in Barbarian, I wouldn't be surprised if the film's commentary on gentrification, which is actually a much more significant part of the story than it might seem on a first viewing, manages to go under the radar for a lot of people. I mean, one of the very first things established in the film is that the house Tess and Keith are staying in is the one remaining decent home in a neighborhood that is otherwise in complete disrepair, with none of the houses appearing even safe to stand in, let alone live in. We witness, thanks to the addition of a flashback to the 1980s, the progression of this neighborhood from a populated, vibrant Hauser Street-like suburb of Detroit to what it now is, a place mowed down by gentrification, abandoned, pushed to the edge of desperation, to the point where that one remaining house only remains that way because a rich asshole bought the property to use as an Airbnb, aka he deliberately contributed to the current situation. It's a nice added element on the constructed nature of the Airbnb business and how people are buying up properties and using them to house people who are visiting areas while completely destroying the economy of the area that they're in, displacing people, creating these beautiful houses that people in this area could really use and that they'll never be able to afford. On top of that, there's an implication, and I don't think the film would have that extended exchange in the flashback without the neighbor who's selling the house if this wasn't the case, that the serial rapist is taking early advantage of the changes that have begun to rear its head in order to get away with his crimes. It's an important part of the film's narrative, and it's actually impressive that it's in there alongside the patriarchal toxic masculinity commentary without making the movie's messaging feel overstuffed. And that, more than anything else, is what really makes Barbarian great. It really is a singular piece of horror media. Now, let me be clear. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel for horror cinema. This still has the overall trappings and excitement and macabre thrills that we go to horror movies to see, but the way that it brings them to us, the way the story unfolds, the twists and story developments that occur are an incredibly well thought out subversion of the genre's tropes. I mentioned a few things already, such as Keith and how the face heel turn you spend the movie waiting for never comes. But I also think that his role in the movie, the sum total of the part he has to play in the narrative, is a subversion in and of itself. Tess is our hero, and Keith is positioned as a sort of co-lead, except that just as their story seems to hit its climax, we suddenly cut away to another storyline entirely. There's what seems to be a good 20 minute stretch where both characters are completely absent from the film, and at first, it's a bold move. As it goes on, you start to wonder what the hell the point is, and then it all congeals together for a third act that only serves to make the first two even better by the time you get to the end. Again, Kreger isn't performing some overly complicated remachination of what makes horror horror. He's still making a horror movie and still giving us what we want, but he, like the rest of us, is exhausted by the formulaic and tired bullshit. He's done what's largely felt impossible recently. He's given us a horror movie, really even it goes beyond horror, he's given us a movie that actually surprises its audience. Within the story, what Kreger's script also does is what most great horror films do as well. It has something to say about the world. The most terrifying thing isn't a Freddy Krueger or some mythical demon. The most terrifying things exist in our world and are things which human beings are not only capable of, but things which a disgustingly high number of people actually perpetrate. There is a creature in Barbarian, but it's not the villain of the story. We think it is because of how it's introduced, because of what we expect from these kinds of movies, between killing Keith and displaying its menace to us, but we ultimately learn that this is instead a creature which was literally created from the disgusting predatory actions of a serial abductor and rapist, the true villain of the story. The creature is a tragic figure, a mutated mother desperate to nurse and protect her own with nothing but primal instincts and very little intelligence. She's incredibly sympathetic and the way that she's a personification of Tess's inner struggle of feeling captive or feeling stuck in a situation that she can't get out of only strengthens her role in the film. She's definitely an antagonist, but she's not inherently evil and that's a preconceived notion that the movie not only challenges but even presents initially. 
And I think that ties as well into the ways the story subverts horror expectations. AJ is almost as much of a piece of shit as the serial rapist, but the movie gives him an arc, forces him to reckon with how terrible of a human being he is, makes him inwardly confront himself and points ahead with a bright neon sign to his, at least partial, redemption against an evil even worse than himself. And what does Barbarian do? Have him kill the creatures, save the day, save Tess, find peace, gets redemption? Hell f***ing no it doesn't! When the time comes for him to bear himself to the world, to the film, to the audience, he reverts back to being the slimy, cowardly douchebag that he always was deep down inside. It's not only a gripping subversion and twist, it's a firm statement by Zack Kreger that people very rarely change, no matter how much they might be warped by the events around them. And people especially like AJ definitely don't change. It's a daring note to center the climax of a horror story on, and it's at the end of a hundred excellent minutes of daring choices called Barbarian. Look, if you're not really into horror, I don't know if Barbarian is gonna be your thing. I will say though, if you're just looking for great filmmaking in an era of movies so frequently poo-pooed as being not as good as it used to be, then Zack Kreger in this film might actually be your needed shot in the arm. As for horror fans specifically, Barbarian is absolutely vital viewing. It's incredible. It has the dynamic camera work, grotesque and mean-spirited imagery and dark humor of a Sam Raimi picture with the added claustrophobia of something like The Descent and the batshit insanity of James Wan's Malignant. It works so magnificently well on the big screen and yes, this is a must see on the big screen. You won't get the same effect at home. I mean, you will, but God, seeing this movie with the packed house is, uh, it's magic. We haven't gotten a horror film as fresh as Barbarian in a while, and I highly doubt we'll see another film like Barbarian this year either. That being said, I have a feeling its status as a singular entry in the genre will change in the coming years. If the next few horror filmmakers are at all savvy about the state of the genre, then we'll be looking at Barbarian knockoffs aplomb. And while, on the one hand, that might get us right back to the position we were in that made Barbarian necessary in the first place, it'll also be a further testament to what a magical piece of horror cinema Zack Kreger made.